How can you approach parent guilt with more psychological flexibility? That's what we're exploring today in this Real Play with Dr. Emma Waddington on Your Life in Process. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, I'm a clinical psychologist, and in these Real Plays, we are demonstrating what happens inside of the therapy room. I've been on both sides of the couch in these Real Plays, being the client and also the therapist, and today I am playing the therapist with Dr. Emma Waddington. We're exploring parental guilt and specifically working parent guilt, which is something I know very well, and if you're a working parent, you probably know it pretty well as well. You can feel like you're torn and that you're not doing a good job in any arena of your life. Dr. Emma Waddington is a very busy working mom. She is the founder and clinical director of Us Therapy in Singapore, where she leads professional supervision for clinicians in Singapore, the U.S., Australia. She's held academic positions at various universities and worked in local services in private practice and is an SRP approved supervisor. She practices ACT as well as Gottman Couples Therapy and is the host of Life's Dirty Little Secrets, which she hosted me on a while back. It's a great podcast. You should check it out. And Dr. Emma Waddington, like you and like me, most likely, has a nice load of parent guilt that she carries around. So I thought it would be fun to approach it with ACT, see if we can get a little more wiggle room and psychological flexibility with the goal of holding her parent guilt differently. In ACT, it's not about getting rid of things, so we're not trying to get rid of the parent guilt. In fact, many of us try and rationalize our parent guilt. We try and say, oh, but you are such a good parent, or oh, it doesn't matter if you're not measuring up at work, when inside we actually do care about both a lot, and that is why it is so painful. So we're going to be doing something fun, which is a dance around the hexaflex. And I learned this from Stephen Hayes over a decade ago at one of his advanced act trainings. It was phenomenal to watch him move around the hexaflex. So I'm going to do my best to do an attempt at that today. I do this a lot on retreats with clinicians, and it's a nice challenge for me. I want to be challenged on this podcast because that's how I evolve, get out of my comfort zone a little bit. And I know it's a challenge for Emma as well to put herself out there. So, so grateful for her willingness to do this with me. And I also want to say in the dance around the hexaflex, we're doing this random uh, move from process to process. I'll describe it later in the episode. But in ACT and in process-based therapy, it's not random. There's actually intention. And now with process-based therapy and some of the uh, technology that is coming out, you actually can figure out which process to apply when and which process you want to engage in your life depends on who you are as an individual, the context you are in, and the problem that you're stuck in. So self-compassion is not always useful for everybody in every context, and neither is mindfulness. These types of interventions that we think are magic bullets aren't really magic bullets if you're not applying them with some strategy. And if you want to learn how to put that strategy into place, join me with Dr. Sorochi. September 12th, we're going to be offering a free workshop in process-based therapy through PESI. It's one hour and you can sign up. The link is in my bio. And if you come to that workshop, you get a discount for our six hour longer training. So this is for clinicians. All right. On to my real play with Dr. Emma Waddington as we dance around the ACT processes. I hope you find this episode useful to you if you struggle with parent guilt. Hey folks, for those of you that want to take a deeper dive into ACT with me, don't forget that I have a Foundations of ACT course on my website, drdianahill.com, and also sign up for my Wise Effort newsletter. I have some fun things coming up this fall that you are going to want to know about, and uh, you can sign up for that as well at drdianahill.com. And then so this morning or yesterday, actually, even I started saying, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to do this podcast. And I'm, you know, really, really excited about doing it with Diana. I'm so honored. And he asked me, so are you a therapist or client? And I said, I'm client. And he said, oh, then Diana's therapist. And I said, yeah, she is. Oh boy, that's the hardest one. <laughs> I don't know two. about that. Hard in different ways. Hard in different I ways. Agree. Because how hard it is for therapists to be clients. Actually, one of my hardest clients sometimes is oh my goodness, the therapist. Totally. And then I know I've been a terrible client 
to my therapist in the past. I'm always trying to get behind their their eyes. What are they doing? What's happening in there? Wow. So, so we have yeah. a real we have a real therapist playing a real client. You're not my client. You're a colleague, yes. but yes. you're willing to enter into this role. Of, yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of, of the, being... the turning of the tables. Absolutely. And so when my husband said that, I thought, hmm, is that actually true? I don't know, because actually being vulnerable to a colleague and to the world is pretty scary too. Yeah. No, it feels raw. So I'm not sure I agree with him, perhaps from a performance perspective, but from a sort of heartfelt perspective, it's difficult in different ways. Yeah. So we're both willing to enter that difficulty together and sometimes doing it in this very condensed brief way. I mean, we know this from brief solution focused approaches mm -hmm. that sometimes when you condense down the time to work on something and you only have, we're going to do about 25 minutes of work together. Uh, I know this because I have this whole bells ringing <laughs> thing that I'll tell about people what we're going to be doing. But when you condense down time, sometimes you can get deeper faster because you know yes. that time is limited. So true. So Absolutely. tell me what, you, what you're what you hoping to work on and maybe we can discuss the topic first with your therapist mm -hmm. hat on, what an accomplished therapist you are and <laughs> all, all the leadership roles that you play. Mm -hmm. Then we'll go in, I'll describe the exercise that we're gonna go into together to work on this topic and then we'll debrief at the end. So I was thinking about what would be most useful to me in a very sort of really putting myself in the shoes of a client. Like if I'm coming to therapy, what would I want to be working on? And um, I think at the moment, one of the biggest, stickiest themes for me in my life is um, being a working parent and thinking about, um, yeah, how difficult it is to want to be a great parent and also be a great clinician and also be of great support to my team and all these different roles that I want to be able to do well. Yeah. Um, and in particular, my parent parenting role has recently changed, actually, in, in as much as I have less availability for them, um, which has meant that I have been feeling more guilty and my children have been reacting to it, reacting to my, uh, it's basically, it's, it's like a, I, a shift in the dynamic between me and my children. Now I'm not as available um, and they're protesting. And when they protest, I feel, yeah, tremendous guilt. So you have three kids ages? Yes. Uh, 13, 10, and 6. Okay. And you're in Singapore. Just give us a little more background of like you, your life before we dive into this. Yeah. Um, yes, I live in Singapore with my family, with my husband and my three kids. Um, I run a clinic. So I have, yeah, a fairly big clinic. It's sort of about 20 or so clinicians. And then I have an admin team. I also have a fairly big caseload um, and I have dogs, I have chickens. So I'm busy, I'm busy and I'm very much, I adore my kids and I love spending time with them. And I really like, especially one-to-one -one time and uh, being a very present parent and I get, yeah, lots of satisfaction spending time with them. Um, but it's not always that straightforward. I don't get to choose as much as I, I used to be able to. I used to work um, less, and so I had more flexibility around attending, um, you know, the 500 meetings that you're meant to attend at school and parent-teacher conferences and, you know, picking them up from football, things like that. I just, you know, can't do it anymore. What I was thinking is that, we could do an exercise that I do often in retreats when I'm leading retreats with folks where we do a walk around the hexaflex of ACT, 
the six core processes, but I'm making it the heptaflex today because I'm going to add the seventh self-compassion. But we do it in a way where you don't necessarily know which process I'm working on and where it's random that I pull. I have, I've made up these cards of the awesome. processes. So I have acceptance, being present, perspective taking, values, committed action, self-compassion. That's a bonus one. Nice. Cognitive diffusion. So I have these cards and I'm going to shuffle them. And the idea here is not that we're going to get rid of your parent guilt. I don't mm. know if you can't, can you get rid of parent guilt? I, I, mm, I wish. But, yeah. <laughs> It'd be but nice. That we, but, <laughs> but that maybe we can help you get a little more psychologically flexible around it, hold it yeah. differently than um, the way that you described of sort of like being in this place of inadequacy and all these shoulds kind of weighing you yeah. down, whichever way you turn. Yeah. And, and so I'm going to set a little timer mm -hmm. and it's my insight timer app that I use to meditate, but it makes a nice bell instead of a beep. So we'll, I'll be nice. using that. Nice. Yes. And let's do every it. three minutes, it's going to go off with a bell. And when the bell rings, we'll, I'll have you close your eyes and take a breath. It's just a mindful moment. And I will show the card mm -hmm. without anyone knowing, without you knowing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see. You could also just notice the change in my languaging. You're mm. an astute act practitioner to move into the next process. And that. we'll see if we can kind of open things up in this kind of mm. flexible, creative, intensely Amazing. challenging way. <laughs> yeah. To do it. I'm excited. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm really excited. Yeah. I really need this actually. I am quite feeling quite stuck. It's just really how I am. I'm hoping I will get some movement. So I'm going to start us off with a bell. I'll have you, I'm going to shuffle. So I really don't know what's coming up. I'll have you close your eyes. Yeah. And I'll, I'll pull our first card at random. Okay, folks, I'm going to let you know behind the scenes what card I am pulling. And I start off by pulling the being present card. Notice how I orient her to the present moment. So you can open your eyes and mm -hmm. we've been talking about guilt, this feeling of parental mm -hmm. guilt. And I'm wondering if we can just start by noticing like the level of guilt that you have right now, if you could rate it like on a scale from zero to 10, how big is the guilt on a scale from zero to 10 for you? Nine o'clock AM on a Saturday, Saturday morning. morning. Kids just got back. Yeah. I'd say probably a five. And the reason why it's not higher is because my dad and my husband are home. Okay. So they're so right, being yeah. looked after. Yeah, they're being looked after. So right now when your guilt is at a five, if you were to go inside and describe that five for me, what is, mm -hmm. what is it like in there? What's it like to be Emma with a level five of parent guilt? What does it feel mm -hmm. like to be you? So it feels tight. I feel my chest is tight and I have a bit of a knot in my throat. I noticed as soon as we were going to start this exercise, like the tears, I can feel tears in my eyes already. Um, so yeah, there's like a knot and my tight, it's tightness in my chest. Yeah. It's like a bit of sort of, uh, mm -hmm. So tightness yeah. in your chest and the knot and then the tears that are kind of like just mm. coming. Mm. And also describe for me like what's happening for you. There's guilt. That guilt isn't there. It's a five. But then there's other things that are happening for you right here and right now too. Mm -hmm. Like describe what, what's happening in your room and where you are at, you know, 9 a.m. on a Saturday morning and what's happening in your house. Like what's, what's right here and right now in addition to this guilt? 
So out of my window, I can see my chickens walking around. Um, and the, the house feels really silent. I know only one of my children is up and he's hanging out. My eldest is hanging out with my father, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think my other two are still sleeping. So go ahead and close your eyes and just take a breath. The bell just rang. And I want you to just take a breath and be present with that feeling of guilt that's here, but then there's also more than the feeling of guilt. There's um, chickens walking around. There's a kid sleeping. Your dad is here. Sort of all of this is happening right here and right now. And there's the edge of the tears. And then there's also just your house. Saturday morning. This is what it's like in your home. I pulled the committed action card. Notice how I asked some questions that may start to encourage her to move in the direction of making a change. And then go ahead and open your eyes again. And this guilt that's at a five, right? Mm -hmm. While this is going on, you said it's, sometimes it gets, it gets more than this. Like sometimes it gets mm -hmm. higher. And the reason why it's not higher is because um, you have the support. And I'm curious the guilt when it gets higher. Like you're, at, you're at, not like at a super high spot right now. But if you think about yourself when you're, when you're at a nine or a 10, what happens for you with that guilt that, that you don't like? So I'm, when I'm at a nine or a 10, it's usually that I either can't put them to bed or I have to stay on later than I like to. I get irritable. Um, even just thinking about it now, I can feel the tightness in my jaw. So it kind of goes up a bit. Um, yeah, I'm just generally cranky. So in and, addition to the guilt, there's, there's, there's things that you're doing that you're not liking. Like your kids, yeah. you said, my kids are starting to kind of push back a little bit. Are, they, are these things that, that your kids yeah. would pick up on in terms of you when you're feeling guilty and you're irritable and cranky and tight? Before yeah. Bed? And yes, for example, yeah. So my bedtime, for example, if I have a client or a meeting that sort of coincides with their bedtime, I need them to go to bed. And they're used to this really lovely routine where we cuddle up and we chat and we read books and they don't get that. So they're they're like, you work too much. And then I just get, oh, I can't do all of this. Um, so yeah, that doesn't feel great at all. I don't like that person that I become when I'm there. I pulled the self-compassion card. Listen how I shift to encouraging a more self-compassionate perspective. So I want you to go ahead and close your eyes one more time here. And I want you to imagine that you could almost see that person that you don't like mm. and notice that she's in that place of like, she just wants the kids to go to bed. She's feeling super frustrated at them. And I'm wondering if you could also see that underneath that, how torn she feels. Mm. She has these extra okay. demands of her work. She okay. really misses the time with her kids. And she's in this transition, like this time when she needs to be learning more and doing more. And she has the loads of, you know, her clients, but also 20 clinicians. And it, can you see all the loads that she's carrying in that moment? Yeah. Keeping your eyes closed, how do you feel towards her? Actually really sad. Tell me more about that. Like I can see that she's trying really hard and it's just, it is really hard. It's a lot. And she wants to do a good job. And yeah. If you were to go up to her and offer her 
something like with this, you know, this sad feeling, what would you want? What would you want to offer her? A hug. A hug and tell her that you're doing a good job. You really are. And what if she doesn't believe that? Yeah. Yeah. And just hold her. And let her know that I'm there for her. Mm -hmm. And that I care about her. I'm also wondering if you could trace her back to an earlier time. Maybe when she was younger of if you could go back in time and you could find another time when she felt this way, maybe it wasn't guilty around kids, but it was guilty around something else. A younger version of you. Is this a familiar feeling? This feeling of guilt, the feeling of not measuring up. Yeah, definitely. I pulled the acceptance card. Notice how we shift to acceptance of emotions. What's the familiar place that you would go back to in your life? Yeah, not being enough at home or feeling like no matter what I do, it's it's not enough. Believing that no matter what you do, it's not enough. And what's the feeling yeah. associated with that? Yeah, shame. Shame and Loneliness, actually. Yeah, she was quite lonely. Mm -hmm. How long has this been around for, this feeling of not good enough and shame and loneliness? Gosh, I suspect as long as I can remember, actually. So this, is, this thread has been traveling with you your whole life, and now it's showing yeah. up with your with your parenting, but it's shown up in other places too for you. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it makes me so sad. Where are you feeling that sadness in your body? Yeah, it's, it's kind of here. Sort of like, yeah, especially that little girl that really did just, yeah, Kind of this just wanted to be loved and didn't really know how to do it. Didn't really know how to get it right. Seems like the sadness is part of your caring for this little girl. Yeah? Mm, yeah. And I'm wondering if you can make some room for that, that feeling of sadness for her and also the feeling of sadness for the you when you're at a level 10 of guilt, like that maybe that sadness is something that's really important for you to feel because it's a feeling of you caring. Do you make, do you feel that connection that the sadness is your compassion? Yes. And how far it is in that moment when I'm at a 10. Mm. Mm-hmm. I don't feel the sadness. I feel the frustration and the disappointment with myself. I pulled the cognitive diffusion card. Listen how we shift into looking at thoughts. What thoughts are going through your head when you're in that place of frustration with yourself? Like, what's wrong with me? Mm hmm. What's wrong with me that I can't figure this out and do a good job? What's wrong with me? Why can't I figure this out? Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Any thoughts about your kids? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Lots of thoughts about them. <laughs> sort of, you know, on the one hand, the frustrated sort of part of me is thinking, just, just you know, help me out here, please. Mm -hmm. You see how difficult this is? I'm you know, trying to do all of this stuff. And it's also for you that I'm doing all this stuff. And then I feel bad because I'm like, it's not 
really their problem. It's my problem. Mm-hmm. But, and so then I, I, I started to think, oh, poor them. They're having this monster of a mother that's shouting at them and frustrated with them when, you know, it's really me. Seems like it would be hard to contact the sadness if you're that entangled in those thoughts. Like I, I yeah. almost envision like a storm of thoughts about you, about them, and then guilt for having the thoughts about them and then guilt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. true. If you were to act from the sadness and not the thoughts, how do you think yeah. you would act differently than the way that you're acting? Um. Gosh, that makes me sad just thinking about it. I can feel the tears because there's a relief with that. Mm. Um, I think if I was acting in sadness, I'd treat myself more kindly. Like it is, it is really hard. And I would probably respond to them differently, like recognizing that this is not what they want. It's very different than when you're acting from your thoughts. Yeah. When you're acting from your sadness. Yeah. Yeah. And I wonder if there'd be like any way you could just be in that storm of thoughts, but find some kind of way to get into the sadness, like some kind of contact with the sadness. And and my guess is that there's something about the sadness that is so connected to the whole reason why this guilt here is, is in here the first place, which is your what you care about. You can probably guess which card I just pulled. Yes, it's values. Take a listen to how we explore values. Yeah. The torn feelings between you, your kids, and your work. What is it that yeah. you care deeply about that's making you sad? I mean, it sounds ironic. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it now that I care deeply about giving sort of the permission to feel and for people to, um, you know, the value around honesty and openness around feelings and an autonomy and being able to express the permission to express how you feel is really important to me. Um, And so I think I hadn't thought about it actually before, but I think in those moments where I'm getting frustrated with the kids, I'm also frustrated that I'm not able to give them permission to express what they're thinking and feeling because I need them to go to sleep. And I want to be, you know, what matters is to be a loving, kind, open-minded, generous mom. And also to be present to my clients because often this is what I'm going on to doing and thinking I'm going to show up an internal mess with my clients. Um, So it's really important for you to be able to make space for your kids to express themselves. You want that like freedom of expression, what you're feeling is okay. And then you're also really wanting to show up in a way that is um, present and loving. Yeah. These values that are so important to you in some way are driving the feelings that you're having. And I'm wondering if you were to make a move that was in line with those values in that moment, what it would look like. Wow. I guess... It's hard, isn't it? Like, I would have to, like, for me in that moment, if I would have to hear their complaints. I'd have to hear them saying, Mommy, I need you. I want you to be with me. And I'd have to sit with that feeling that, that I can't. I pulled the perspective taking card. Take a listen to how I help Emma get more flexible with her perspective. If you were to get behind the eyes of your child. Yeah. And look at you. 
and say, mommy, I need you. Mm. I want you to be with me. Yeah. And say that child were to see you and all the things that you, you know, have to do tonight and you have to run off and see clients and do the things from that child's perspective. Mm. What is it they really need for you? in just that 30 seconds, that one minute of time, what would make them feel yeah. the way that you want to make them feel? What is it? A hug and I love you and I care about you. You mean the world to me. So I want you to imagine that you could, just as you offered that to yourself, you could offer that to the, your child. Imagine you, a mom, coming at you like you're, you're, the, you're your kid. Pick a kid, whichever one you want. Which mm. kid do you want it to be? Um, let's say it's uh, my daughter, Mia. Okay. Little Mia, little six-year-old Mia, gets her mom to come in and just for 30 seconds. Yeah. Receive that hug. Yeah. And feel how nourishing just that 30-second hug is. And then I want you to also then step back into you as your, as your mom self. Yeah. And I want you to imagine giving Mia that hug. Yeah. Really give her like all of it. And feel the generosity of that hug. And then I want you to imagine that you could then go off and see your clients. Yeah. And when that guilt comes along with you, you know, kind of like creeps back up in your chest or your throat when you're sitting with a client because you know your little ones are going to bed. Yeah. And back to committed action. I pulled the committed action card one last time. What do you want to do with that guilt? What do you want to offer yourself with that guilt? What's one action you can take? I'd love to give myself that hug. Give myself permission to feel the sadness. And to know that it comes from a place of love. Yeah. Because that guilt's going to come back again. In some yeah. ways, it's like the guilt is sort of like the bell. It's kind yeah. of like annoying. It's like, this is interrupting my moment here, this guilt. <laughs> I was on a flow. But it also is a reminder. Like, I'm wondering if yeah. you could use the, the guilt as, as, the, as the mindfulness bell yeah. of your love. It's the mindfulness oh, wow. of your love. Yeah. And it's a oh, time wow. to pause and give yourself a hug. Or if your kids are present, to pause and give your kids a hug. I find that so moving. Yeah. Such a beautiful way to see it. Well, why don't you take a nice long breath? And do you feel like we can open our eyes and slowly come back into this space with each other? Kind of holding on to, you know, how personal that was for you. And then we're going to be talking yeah. about what just happened um, and just thank you so much for going there. Yes. And, wow. And doing this. I should have brought some tissues. <laughs> yeah. Well, parent <laughs> guilt. Yeah. That's good. Um, yeah. That was great. So brave of Emma for doing that with me. And we are going to talk in a moment, debrief. Emma and I about what we just did. But while the real play is fresh, I want to give you a little behind the scenes about the cards that I pulled and what my attempted intervention was. So this is what I was doing. The first card I pulled was being present. And my uh, intervention there was first to have Emma get in contact with her guilt in the present moment. And that's actually helpful because you start to see, oh, it's a five, but it's not always a five. Sometimes it's a 10. We get into a story about what's happening. And when you get present, you get into reality. 
And then I was also working on flexible awareness because I asked her about her guilt, but also what was happening in her house. What did she see? What was going on? And that type of flexible awareness is super helpful when you're feeling a strong emotion. So you don't get totally bogged down by the emotion. You can get present with emotion, but then also see, hey, there's chickens outside. Hey, my kid's asleep. The second process that we went into was committed action, and it was way too early. That was just my intuition as a therapist. I'm not going to have her start making an action plan three minutes into our conversation. But instead, what I did is I asked her some questions like, what's happening for you that you don't like when you feel guilty? And in some ways, that's a little precursor to committed action, creating a little uh, creative hopelessness. Like there's things that you're trying to do that to avoid or control your guilt that you're not liking. She didn't like that she was getting frustrated and yelling at her kids. That's the first step in committed action. You got to see what's not working, right? And then the next process we went into was self-compassion. And when I did the intervention of self-compassion, I had her step back and look at herself in her own struggle, the loads that she carried, and see if we could generate sort of a compassionate view on herself. That can be really helpful when you're experiencing parenting guilt is to shift your perspective to look at yourself. Wow, you're carrying a lot right now. This is really hard. And that may help you feel more compassionate as opposed to just feeling mad at yourself for not being able to do it well. The next process that we worked on was acceptance. And we talked about making space for the sadness and the guilt that she felt. That was really the goal of that one. Uh, With acceptance, you can practice just making more room for what you're feeling. And it did feel like in some ways this whole real play was a real play of acceptance. We didn't do a whole lot to change her guilt. We just made room for it to be there and made room for the other feelings that were there, sadness and frustration. I would say, you know, down the road, if she were my client, I would also get to a place of looking at the loads that she's carrying and how she's carrying them. And if are there changes that she wants to make in her life, maybe she wants to be working less so that she can go pick up her kids. But without going to acceptance first, it's hard to start problem solving the big picture. These processes will help her become more psychologically flexible so that she can problem solve and maybe make some decisions that are based on her values around restructuring her life and where she wants to put her wise effort. The fifth process that we did was values. That one may have been an obvious one. I talked about um, this connection between sadness and values and how does she want to be with her kids? How does she want to be with her clients? And she was really darn clear on her values. That would be an indicator for me as a therapist. It's not that she's lacking values. She's got clarity of values all over the place. There's something else going on here that she could use some help with. We did some work next on cognitive diffusion. And in that one, I asked her, you know, what thoughts are going on when you feel really frustrated for her to be able to start to observe her thoughts. And then also seeing her thoughts as sort of like the storm, using that metaphor with thoughts can be really helpful because once you start to see your thoughts as sort of like a metaphor, they're like a storm, or I've used the metaphor of a rooster, then you can decouple your thoughts from your actions. Could you have that storm going on in your head and act independently from it? The last process that we did was perspective taking. And we did perspective taking on having her actually get behind the eyes of her own child. And if you think about that, if you have all these expectations for ourselves of what our kids want or what we should be doing. And if you actually get behind the eyes of your child and see you as a parent looking or a caregiver looking at you, what they really want, what is it they really want is exactly what she saw. I just want you to give me a hug. I just want you to be here right now with me, mom. And they're not caught up in the same story that you are. So that type of perspective taking can be helpful as well. And then at the very end, I repeated a process. I went back to committed action because I'm sort of the perfectionist and I felt like I didn't really give you a good example of committed action. So I went back to it again. And that's when we talked about guilt as a mindfulness bell, pointing out your values. When that guilt shows up, can you take a breath? Can you remember, oh, this is here for a reason. And can you act on what you value? Giving yourself a hug, giving your kid a hug, present for your client. And that's a great little tiny committed action that she could actually take away and do. And that, hey, you could take away and do as well. I imagine you're listening all the way to the end of this episode because you have maybe some caregiver or parent guilt as well, or you work with clients that have that. So those are the processes that we did. You know, I did my best, but of course, my own critic jumped in about this whole thing. 
it's a good example of that there's a lot you can do in 20 minutes with psychological flexibility when you start to look at it through some of these lenses, where you're placing your attention, what your values are, and what could you lean into more and accept so that you can open up and then do what you want to do and act how you want to act. Okay, back to my conversation with Emma, where we will debrief our real play. I'm just curious what it what it felt like for you, if anything shifted for you, um, yeah. moments where it was like going nowhere or moments where there, this is therapy. Like there's moments where like, oh, that was good. I needed that. And then there's moments like, I don't know where we're going with this. So yeah, just yeah. what was your, your experience with it? I went in not expecting a lot as in, I thought this is such a big issue for me. There's no way we're going to do anything in 20 minutes. <laughs> so I went, I thought to myself, let's just, you know, let's just go and roll with it. And I really wanted to be real. I wanted to be as real as possible in order for actually to reap the benefits of having you for 20 minutes. It was so moving to think of myself as this little girl. And what I found most useful is that place where I could see my guilt as a bell and a reminder to, yeah, that it's what matters and that I can be. And that sadness that that guilt is reminding me that there is, that is actually sadness and that I want to treat myself in that sadness. Compassion and kindness is very powerful. I hadn't connected before my guilt and sadness together, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we almost had to go from guilt. And then we went to anger and then we went to sadness and then we got yes. to, to values. Yes. And, and I love in, in act the, the sort of the line that acts not about feeling good. It's about getting good at feeling or it's not about feeling better. It's getting better at feeling. And that it's almost like we got to a place of getting better at feeling guilt. Yes. And a lot of times with parent guilt, it's get rid of parent guilt. You don't have to feel guilty. And, um, and, Maybe what the the psychological flexibility practices is just how can I get better at feeling guilt? <laughs> yes, because I don't know if it ever goes away. You no, know, I and, agree. And it's like how do I how do I work with it? Identify my values with it, and then act and not have it push me around. That's right. Yeah, and and I think the piece that I hadn't connected, and you know, as I'm telling you this, I'm having my voice is like. What kind of therapist are you that you hadn't connected that? But thank you, mind. I hadn't connected the guilt, frustration, and sadness. Like I hadn't connected that, you know, when I'm feeling guilty and I'm being and I'm frustrated and I'm responding from that place of frustration, that's actually adding to my guilt. And I hadn't recognized where the sadness that's this there's actual sadness there that, you know, I just can't do this. I can't do the job that I want to do. And that's a much more useful place to see it from. Right. And and much closer to compassion. Yes, exactly. It's hard to be compassionate with anger. Hard to be compassionate with anger. So when we're in, we're in sadness, we may be able to both be more compassionate towards ourselves, but also towards our kids. Yeah. And then we also can connect with our kids sometimes from a place of sadness, not to layer the sadness on them, but just to be like, I love you. That's why, you know, I'm feeling sad about saying goodbye or, yes. yeah, and then they feel that love. I'm curious what it was like. So I found the doing of the cards really hard for me as a therapist. I would have, I feel like I wasn't as fluid as I would be as a therapist mm. with the cards because I was being forced. I got forced really early the hand of committed action and I was not ready to do committed action. Oh, really? Because I don't card, know the cards. Had. Yeah, That's so interesting. I, got, I got forced that hand and then I just didn't do anything with it. I was like, I kind of did a little bit, but I like, I can't force a committed action. So then I pulled, I, I saved it and pulled it again as our last card. And that's what the, um, that's what the mindfulness spell was, was the committed action after all of this, because committed action too early is like, oh, sometimes can be too much. But I, I'm curious, did you have hypotheses while we were going or did it just feel, did it feel fluid to you moving through all these different processes? It's so funny, yeah. isn't it? Because as 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 in as we were going through and I was hearing the bell, I was feeling for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's like, oh crap, she has to change again. Yeah, yeah. I think at the time, was, three minutes is nothing. 
in a process. Yeah, I was, and and then I was thinking, geez, but it it works. As in, it flowed. It was really quite. Didn't feel the changes. It wasn't like I thought. Oh my goodness, it's a new card. We're thrown into a new process. It just shows how how well your skill, but also how they are all interweaved. Really, processes. And if you were to take a test, sometimes I would be like I was given the acceptance card. When I pulled that card, you could have called what I was doing. That was when you were going back in time to visit your younger self. Was and it so acceptance? Oh, that, cool. Then we moving into acceptance and like, what is she feeling? That you could also say that's a perspective taking card. So many of these processes are reflect each other. You know, acceptance has so much of being present in it and also perspective taking. And that's sort of also understanding that you can't really pull apart. You can't tease apart. It's like colors of a rainbow. They're all part of each other in some way. They blend into each other. Yeah. That's right. And because I didn't notice, I was kind of as a half eye thinking. Initially, I was like, let me guess the process. And then I thought, no, yeah, don't do that. That will get in the way of, of the experience. But yeah, it really flowed very nicely. It was very skillful. And I'm amazed at how much movement I got in 20 minutes. What would you do next? If you were the therapist and you and mm. this were your client and you were going to say, okay, what am I going to tackle next session? What would, I, what would you <sighs> want to work on with this client? Spend more time in the sadness. I think for her, the guilt is really, really strong. And the frustration and the disappointment and probably work a bit about, I think one of the most powerful moves you did was bringing me back to that little girl. And I had compassion for that little girl. And I really mm -hmm. felt that sense of sadness, like you just can't get it right, can you? Yeah. And so I would probably spend more time with that little girl and the guilt that she felt and the shame that she couldn't get it right and the frustration that she felt towards situations where she couldn't get it right and how similar it is. Mm -hmm. And that just evokes self-compassion. We can see our little girl inside of us and then we can see, I kind of yeah. feel like her right now. That's like, right. Here she is. I feel, you know, even just sort of how you were describing I, how, you know, I should be a therapist and I should have figured this out or I should be able to use the skill or hadn't made that connection again. It may be that you're not making that connection or you're not figuring it out because you're a little girl <laughs> in that moment, overwhelmed with guilt or overwhelmed with, I can't get this right. And, and you don't have the capacities of, of the, of your adult therapist self out wow. yet. Right. And so you need her, like we need to have her show up for that little girl, even as an adult. Yeah. That's so cool. I really like that. So that would be so helpful to do that work on myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now you have an assignment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, um, your podcast is about dirty little secrets. You did one on wow. me where I, had, I shared a dirty little secret. I love the topic. Tell us just a little bit about that, why you're doing that podcast. Yeah. So um, I do a podcast called Life's Dirty Little Secrets with Chris McCurry. And we wanted to do a podcast on really helping um, shed light on these little secrets that we all carry that are in fact make us incredibly human and are common to all of us. And instead of, you know, hiding these parts of us, uh, we wanted to shed light to them so that we don't feel that there's something about us that is wrong or broken or uh, shameful but in fact you know it's okay we're in it together we're all in the same soup as they say so really about growing self-compassion and recognizing that being human is inherently difficult and that we could all do with a with a hug and a bit more support actually <laughs> yeah even us psychologists well, thank you for sharing. This may be a little dirty, little secret of yours around feeling That's right. Parent guilt. That's and, right. And underneath that, a core feeling of I maybe I'm not enough. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This is it's felt like a real gift. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Your Life in Process. When you enter your life in process, when you become psychologically flexible, you become free. Please join me as a member at yourlifeinprocess.com. And if you like this episode or think it would be helpful to somebody, please leave a review over at podchaser.com. 
or call me at 805-457-2776. Email me at podcast at yourlifeandprocess.com. I want to thank my team, Craig, Ashley Hyatt, Elaine Schmelkin, and thank you to Ben Gold at Bell & Branch for his original music. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only, and it's not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment.